All right. Thank. I was about to. I was about to ask, so I'm glad you offered. Uh, I am a proud Aggie, but cer certainly a Tiger fan too, as uh, as the inside of my coat would uh, attest to. Uh, so anyway, thanks for having me again. Uh, my name is Connor Patterson from here in Baton Rouge. I recently got back into town um, to join Calais Dermatology, and Dr. Chastain asked me to speak today on uh, the topic of skin cancer, uh, specifically as Dr. Chastain and, and General Honore uh, mentioned uh, on prevention. What, what can we do to prevent or, at, at, if not prevent, detect early? Uh, and as we get into this talk, you'll find out how important it is and what a difference maker it is to detect early and, and how, how outcomes are so much better if you do. And I want to empower you to you know, be more comfortable looking at your own skin to know when do I need to go see the dermatologist or uh, my primary doc or, or when can I rest a little bit easier and, and kind of keep an eye on things. So this is really about um, prevention, uh, educating uh, ourselves uh, to, uh, to take care of some of these things. So that's my goal. Um, the title of it, as you see, is Checkpoints of Skin Cancer and I used uh, David Letterman's uh, top 10 list as just a real rough template uh, to bring up some observations relating to skin cancer as kind of jumping off points to talk more in depth uh, about some issues uh, in skin cancer. So without uh, further ado, let's, let's jump right into uh, our first observation and we'll go uh, from 1 to 10 instead of 10 to 1 like, uh, like Dave does. Um, number one, uh, I want you to be aware of the prevalence of skin cancer. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer at some point uh, in their lifetime. Uh, that's uh, well over a million uh, cases of skin cancer, well over a million cases of skin cancer. Yearly, 80% of these skin cancers um, are basal cell type skin cancers, by far the most common. Um, don't spread elsewhere in the body, but as we'll get into later, they certainly can affect our quality of life. Uh, like General Honore said, uh, we want to uh, grow old and then die. Uh, we want to grow old and enjoy those old, uh, old years also and not be burdened by, by things like uh, basal cell skin cancer and such. The other 15, uh, another 15 percent are squamous cell type skin cancers. They, they have the potential to spread elsewhere but typically they don't and if we pick those up early we can treat them. Only 5 percent represent melanoma and that, that's likely the type of skin cancer that you've heard the most about in the media uh, and that's for good reason. Only 5 percent of skin cancers are melanoma Unfortunately, it accounts for 75% of skin cancer deaths um, today. So I'm going to really emphasize melanoma prevention and early detection today because I, I think that's a real game changer. And then we'll talk about the more common, you know, among your buddies, family members, uh, these basal cell and squamous cell type skin cancers, which may not be a threat to life. They're a threat to quality of life. And... Um, you know, I haven't done this a lot, so uh, they we're going to do this informal. Uh, and, and if anybody has any questions as we go through, feel free to pipe in. If not, uh, I'll certainly hang around at the end of the talk to, uh, to discuss anything uh, further. Moving on uh, with some just further skin cancer facts. Uh, again, many more than one million cases of skin cancer a year. Uh, about 100,000 100, new cases of melanoma uh, will be diagnosed yearly. Uh, and, and that'll account for about 10,000 melanoma deaths. That's one every hour, 10,000 melanoma deaths. And again, basal cell is our most common. Uh, bar none, the main cause of all skin cancer. Uh, we know is ultraviolet radiation. We know it from mouse models where we, uh, where we inflict UV radiation on, on uh, albino or nude ma mice at certain doses, and we can predictably create skin cancer. It causes DNA mutations and DNA mutations lead to full speed ahead, no breaks uh, on, on the cancer. That's really what cancer is. So the sun is, is the source of this UV radiation. Um, uh, certainly our attitudes over the last century have changed uh, with regard to the sun and our appearance, uh, particularly uh, in, in regard to how it affects our appearance. Hopefully this morning, uh, as Paul Harvey would say, I can kind of present uh, the rest of the story, um, what happens after the, the pretty bronze body and stuff. And, and, and as you guys know, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, things were a lot different. Quite frankly, as you can tell, 
And, and as you see uh, in society, you know, people bumming around, quite frankly, people wore more clothes in yesteryear and they, used, <laughs> they wear less clothes now. Uh, whether it be swimming, typical things where we think of, you know, we just have our bathing suit on. Uh, people wore many more clothes, kids playing in a lake, uh, pretty well dressed uh, back in the early part of, of this century. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in today's society, uh, our, our bathing suits uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller, it seems, by the year. Uh, that it's not just in the swimsuit sort of industry and other recreational activities. Uh, Anna Kornikova reminds us that this is, uh, this is in tennis, this is in our, our uh, fishing activities uh, here in the Gulf Coast, etc. cetera. Um, George Hamilton uh, wanted us all to uh, be aware that uh, tan was in, um, and our media has certainly propagated this sort of idea of what's good looking. It was really redefined in, uh, around 1920 when the fashion guru Coco Chanel in Paris uh, she lived in Paris. She returned from a vacation in the French Riviera with this bronze body, um, and she got on this idea of pushing the, the bronze body is, is the best looking. It signifies wealth and the time to go hang out and lay around on beaches. Uh, so that's kind of what redefined this, this thought that this is the best looking skin. And, and people have obviously bought into it, as you can see from uh, a little spoof, uh, something about Mary movie. Add to that the more recent um, popularization of tanning beds, and we really have a perfect storm of UV radiation. And again, UV radiation applies to basal cell skin cancers, squamous cell skin cancers, and the most lethal melanoma type uh, skin cancer. Melanoma um, involves genetics. We can't change that, and it involves UV radiation. We can change that. So let's be in control of what we can. Um, and be as educated as we can to sort of pick up on things early. That, that leads us in, or segues into our second point that I want you to uh, be aware of, and we'll jump off from there, that the incidence of melanoma is rising faster than that of any other cancer. Uh, and I've got a graph later that, that I hope I can convince you that it coincides with the early part of this century when our attitudes of, uh, of sun protection and what looks good changed Certainly it takes some time for UV radiation to kind of catch up to you to get these, these skin cancers. Um, in the media, we certainly uh, know uh, numerous people who have been affected by melanoma. This is Senator John McCain. As you can uh, see, fair skin, you know, light hair, has spent a lot of time in the sun, starting in as many years uh, in the service uh, and then in Arizona. He's had four separate melanoma type skin cancers um, three of them very thin. This one on his left temple was deep enough to necessitate a surgical dissection of his lymph nodes to make sure that it has, it, the melanoma had not spread to his lymph nodes. So sometimes you'll see a little, uh, a little jowl, and, and that's what that's about. Yes, sir? Didn't he get most damage when he was a uh, prisoner of war in Vietnam when they staked him out for hours in the sun? Without a doubt, he, he, without a doubt he got... Uh, I'll bet. Yeah, you know, it's really cumul cumulative, and he, he certainly got a lot of his, I, I think, as you said, at that time. Um, a, uh, a friend of my father's a dermatologist down in Homa. Uh, I can remember the analogy that he, uh, he gave me years ago before I was thinking about dermatology, and kind of he was educating us on uh, skin cancer and, uh, and good protection. He said, he said it's, we all have a bucket. and some people, we have a huge bucket, we won't start getting problems or skin cancers until that bucket gets full. But some of us have a small bucket. And, and every day we walk from our house to the car, we're putting a little bit of water in that bucket. Some people overflow sooner because they have a smaller bucket. Doc, uh, John McCain, smaller bucket. Okay? I like to think of it that way, Alex. Exactly we'll, get to, we'll get to that. That's a good question. What is a melanoma? It's, it's a cancer uh, that starts from a certain type of cell in the skin. And there's really only three or four types of cells, types of cells in the skin. And melanoma has some characteristics that we'll talk about um, that make it a little bit uh, more likely to spread elsewhere in the body. Okay. Um, uh, John McCain was, uh, was fortunate to not have any metastases. Uh, there are other less fortunate. Uh, Bob Marley 
um, shown here on the left, died at the age of 36 uh, from an acral lentiginous type of melanoma. There's about four types of melanoma. Acral lentiginous, acral just means um, palms and soles. Acral lentiginous melanoma, by far the most common in African American skin. He had one under a, a toenail by the time uh, he was evaluated um, and, and sought treatment. It had already metastasized his brain, his lungs, bone, liver. These are kind of high, high points of uh, metastasis. Um, and, and melanoma, Alice, it has a propensity to spread more so than those other ones, and, and we'll talk about why. Uh, on the right, uh, I, some of you may recognize, this is Maureen Reagan, President Reagan's daughter. She died at the age of 60 after fighting melanoma for five or six years, um, uh, metastatic uh, melanoma. It, and if you can appreciate, and we'll talk, we'll kind of hit on it again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat a lot, and I hope, I hope you don't think I'm crazy. But for me, when I'm in an audience, I got to hear something ten times for it to start sinking in. How would the, how would the dryers detect that uh, if it's under your toenail? We're, we're gonna talk about it. There's some signs. We're, there's some signs. That, absolutely, good question. We're gonna. It'd be undetectable. It would be like a little jump on you. Um. Most of the time, there will be some signs, and, and we're going to talk about that. There's a very rare type, very rare, and, and melanoma relative to those other types of skin cancers is rare. There's a very rare type that doesn't make any color, and it makes, it makes our job difficult, no doubt. But in that case, we look for things like bleeding and pain and things like that. Um, so, Alice, getting into just a little bit of the biology of melanoma, this is a close-up um, microscopic photograph of the skin. The very top little, you can barely see it at the top edge, that's kind of the flaky skin, you know, uh, amounts to dust in our house, so to speak. That purple layer is the, the real substance uh, of our skin. Um, and and these, these cells, these two little halo cells, we might call them, those are the melanocytes. Melanocytes produce the color in our, in our skin. Some of, some of our people, uh, who are Caucasian, don't make as much color, but they have melanocytes. We all have the, about the same number of melanocytes. African-American skin, they're just, their melanocytes are much more active. It's a much more productive uh, factory of color. A and that color certainly protects more than not having it. Um, so these, these melanocytes, um, they reside in the skin. They're in all of our skin, but they didn't originate in the skin as opposed to all those purple cells you see around it. They migrated there during early development, you know, in our mother's womb. Uh, they migrated there from nervous tissue. Because they migrated there, they don't really hold on to their neighboring cells as well as those purple cells. All those purple cells um, are, are, are hanging on to each other. They have almost little, little fingers that are grabbing on each other. These halo cells, these melanocytes, they don't have any fingers, so you're seeing them shrink up. And because they're not holding on, we think that that, that gives them a little more ability to spread away from the skin, become metastatic, at which time it can be very, very difficult to treat. So that, that's oftentimes why um, melanoma behaves differently than the other more common but less lethal type of skin cancers. So uh, speaking to melanoma a little further, I want you to know melanoma is the fifth most common cancer. Um, melanoma is the most common cancer in women between the age of 25 and 29, and I know that's a short little age span, but I just want you to appreciate that melanoma, while taking all comers, is more common in, in the older age group. There's a decent section of that melanoma pie that is young to middle-aged adults, whether they be, you know, mid-20s, mid-30s, mid-40s, not uncommon at all to, uh, to detect melanomas in that age group. So you don't want to talk your son out of, you know, uh, something that he's concerned about because, ah, you're too young for that. Um, we definitely see melanomas uh, in the younger age group, and that's gotten worse and worse as the tanning industry has, has really gotten hold of, of a lot of our, our young people. Um, almost one in four Americans who do, does develop melanoma is under 40 years of age. So that, that's what we were talking about there. Um, I want you to know that melanoma, uh, as opposed to the basal cell and squamous cell type skin cancers that are really, they're both very involved with UV radiation. Melanoma has that genetic variable um, also. Melanoma, most common areas on the trunk, especially of men, on the legs, especially of women, 
as well as the head and neck. So just because somebody says, I wear a shirt all the time, I'm not one of those you know, dummies that goes and lays on a beach towel in Destin all day, uh, I couldn't have a problem. Um, men on the chest and back or on the face, women on the legs, and we'll talk about how to sort of detect those. Um, getting back to some of those generational issues that I said, I, I wanted to show you this graph. Okay, so you put Coco Chanel redefining that, redefining that good, good looking skin is tan in, in the 20s to 30s. It takes a little time for those DNA mutations to sort of catch up with us. And you see this increasing incidence of melanoma o over the last uh, century. So what are the risk factors for melanoma? Um, we probably all have a risk factor. The more risk factors, um, the, the more you want to be aware. Tendency to tan poorly and burn easily. We call that type 1 skin. I, doc, I can, never, I can never get a tan. I just burn and peel. That's what that is. Fair, complected, blonde hair, blue eyes um, high, is a risk factor. History of excessive sun exposure, especially the blistering sunburns at an early age. Um, and one of our observations we'll get to, uh, we'll emphasize that. Multiple regular old moles, regular old dark moles, um, and, or just a few funny looking moles are risk factors. Uh, one of my teachers up in Pennsylvania used the uh, analogy that it's, it's like the lottery. The more tickets you buy, the more chance you have of winning. The, the more moles you have, the more chance you have of developing a melanoma. It doesn't mean that chances are you're gonna, because we know plenty of people who buy lottery tickets and we don't know many people who've won it. But people do win it and if you didn't buy any, you have less chance of, of getting melanoma than if you had more. So the more moles, especially the more atypical moles, perhaps the more wary. And I've got some pictures to show you uh, of, of what's a lot and what's a little. Um, people with a lot, especially when they're atypical, I recommend every six to 12 months an evaluation by a dermatologist. Alice? Are you talking about race moles? Because moles are hereditary, not genetic. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that. It's interesting. Raised moles um, aren't necessarily a risk factor. Whether it's flat or raised, it is not a, it's not a big, it doesn't give me a lot of information as to am I worried about it? We'll talk about what, what to be worried about. It's coming, coming right up. A family history of melanoma, that's the genetic variable. Um, that, that, that I think is a big one. Um, direct, uh, direct family members, mom, dad, brother, sisters. Melanoma. So if you, if you had a melanoma treated in the past, I, I always encourage my patients, um, tell your kids to, whenever they fill out their health history, when they go to the doctor, on their medical history should be family history of melanoma. Whether, whether they're at their GP and they don't have a, a, a question that actually says that, they say, give us some other information. Family history of melanoma, all it does, it's easy enough to do, and all it does is, is tell the doc, hey, you know, take a look at this person's skin or be aware, take their questions seriously, because there is a genetic variable. We don't know like what chromosome it's on, and it's definitely right here. We can pick it out, but there's a genetic variable, and we can see that in family trees. Um, I'm going to put, put the cart before the horse briefly and jump over to prognosis of melanoma, and then we'll work back. Tumor thickness, the thickness of the melanoma when it's detected, is it, that's the most important information to say, boy, this is going to be no problem, or we need, to, we need to get on top of this. The thickness of that melanoma. So obviously that tells you, I mean, anything, that, when something starts, it's as thin as it can be, and the longer, the longer you, it's observed and not treated, the thicker it gets. So thickness dictates everything, and, and, and I want you to be aware of that uh, because that's why we want to detect early. Because when a melanoma is one millimeter or less, look at that five-year survival. I, it's, I, I, I tell my patients, you're going to be fine. We're going to... We're going to cut this out with an appropriate margin, put a few stitches in, you're going to be great. But as you approach two and a half, you know, two, two and a half millimeters deep, again, that's, there's some time that's involved. Some melanomas grow a little quicker than others, but we're not talking days, we're talking weeks to months. Um, the deeper you get, 
the five-year survival really uh, tapers off, and that's because the deeper you get, the more blood vessels, the higher chance of, of spread. And what, melanoma is very treatable when thin, very treatable. Um, it, melanoma is very difficult, perhaps one of the di most difficult cancers of all comers to treat once it's metastasized, which why I think this talk plays into this Louisiana Men's Health prevent, prevention and early detection and powering our own eyes, uh, it really fits in well because this is where you can make a difference um, in your own health. So now that we've talked about the prevalence of melanoma, we know it's going up, risk factors for developing melanoma, fair skin, lots of ugly moles type thing. Uh, we know the prognosis already that, um, that we want to know the thickness of that. So let's talk about early detection because thin melanoma is very treatable, the thicker, much more difficult. So you have a you go to your wife or your doc and you say, I got a suspicion, suspicious looking mole on my shoulder. What makes you say it's suspicious? W what may make the doctor say it's okay uh, or it needs to be biopsied to look at it under the microscope because that does give us much more definitive. That's the gold standard in diagnosis. But we can't go around demoling everybody as I'm sure you're, you're aware. So the commandments of melanoma detection and surveillance are the A, B, C, D, E's, and, and I'm sure you, you guys have heard that, and I hate to um, bore you with it, so to speak, but it's what dermatologists rely on, and it's what we tell the community to rely on. A stands for asymmetry. If you drew a line down the middle of that mole, do the two sides look the same, or are they vastly different? We don't hang our hat on any one letter, but we add them all up. Uh, B reminds us to look at the borders. Are they irregular? Are they scalloped? Are they kind of nice and smooth? Color stands for color variability. We, we often think of the um, American flag, the red, white, and blue sign. Or, you know, do you have a red, a dark purple, a black, a, a kind of a white area in a mole? More concerning than an even, medium to dark brown. More, relatively more concerning. Diameter is the D. Typically we think six millimeters. That's about the size of the eraser on a pencil. Maybe that's a dividing line. That's not a major one in my, in my mind. E. And, the, and then I go to the other end of the alphabet uh, to remember uh, the ugly duckling sign. E and the ugly duckling sign are the most important. E is evolving. Remember I said melanomas change over the course of weeks to months. Common moles may change, and I'm sure we all have observed our regular moles change, typically over the course of years, several years. You know, Doc, over the past one to three years, this mole's changed a little bit. Melanoma's going to change over the course of weeks to months. Um, so that allows, that gives us a little time to keep an, keep an eye on things. The ugly duckling sign, um, I, I often use the analogy of, of the fingerprint. We all have a unique fingerprint. We kind of all make a unique mole. Some people, they make ugly moles. And if they come in with a hundred irregular moles that have a little bit of asymmetry, that have some color variability, you know, if they have 50, they did not come in my office with 50 melanoma type skin cancers. I feel good about that. Better than I would about taking one of that one of those same moles off that person and putting it on somebody who has four evenly colored moles elsewhere and that one ugly duckling. So the ugly duckling sign and evolving I think are the most important. A, B, C, D, E, other end of the alphabet, ugly duckling. There's our ugly duckling. Just com compare it to your moles. What kind of company do your moles sort of um, associate with. Uh, these are, I'm going to, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, I know I'm verbose, but I'm going to try to let some of the pictures do the talking. Uh, these are some pictures of melanoma, and you can just, you know, in your mind, think of the A, B, C, asymmetry. Draw a line down the middle of that. The two halves don't look the same. The borders are scalloped on that upper right side. There are three different colors. I think clearly there's this little pinkish white area right here. I hope you can appreciate. There's a dark brown, a light brown, and this is a clearly scalloped border. Okay, we don't get to see, um, we don't have an appreciation for size uh, uh, there. This, this melanoma happened to be 0 0.26 uh, millimeter. I'm sorry, I said one millimeter earlier. 0 0.1 millimeter is, is a big line in the sand of, of catching a melanoma earlier or not. This is 0.26 millimeters, fairly deep, might need to have their lymph nodes checked to make sure it hadn't spread. This is a common mole. 
Um, you, some, some of you may say, ah, it looks a little asymmetric to me. Um, but in general, draw a line sort of from 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Um, you can find symmetry there. Um, the borders are, are, certainly aren't as scalloped as the previous lesion. The color, eh, that's a pretty even color there. That, I feel good about um, that. Again, hard to say about size. And, and, and you've got to ask the patient, has it changed? Um, and we don't get to see the other moles uh, except for that little small spot on the bottom left. Looks a similar shade of brown, so we feel, we feel okay about that. And I hate to scare you, um, but I'm going to show you one. The next picture is going to be a melanoma, and it's going to, at first glance, going to look like this, but then we're going to kind of walk through um, some of the differences. This was a, this was a, deep, uh, a deep melanoma. Looks sort of similar, but boy, it's darker. I always, I always tell my patients, uh, charcoal blacks, jet blacks, um, I'm a little more concerned about. Um, likely this, this comes in with a history of, boy, this wasn't here six months ago, or, or this was flat for four years, and suddenly over the last six months, this is a bump, and it's a lot darker, Doc, and it may have bled. Um, you know, we want to catch, catch that. That's a pretty even color, I, I agree with you. It's dark, uh, and it deserves, it deserves a biopsy. This is likely an ugly duckling if, the other per if this person has other moles uh, elsewhere. This is an obvious, this is an obvious um, melanoma. Uh, it, it's, become, um, it's become thick. It's jet black. Uh, you talked about the nail melanoma, and, and how, do you, how could he have known? How could anybody have known? Um, not uncommon. Uh, in the population, more common the darker the skin, such that uh, African Americans, maybe as high as 75 percent, uh, can have dark nail streaks. Um, several of them, uh, maybe 40 percent of Asians, uh, 10 to 15 percent of Caucasians can have dark nail streaks. Trauma can cause dark nail streaks. There's a lot of different causes. Um, but if you don't have any other dark nail streaks, and suddenly you know, you're 35 and you've got a new nail streak and you didn't have any trauma, apply your ABCDEs and the ugly duckling sign to this as well. This is a subungal melanoma, the acral uh type that we talked about, Bob Marley, and, and certainly uh, asymmetry, multiple colors, no good, you know, if we don't have a good reason for this being here, I wasn't out in my shop, you know, hammering, right, went out in my shop hammering, uh, could it be other things? Sure, but it needs to be, it does need to be investigated. We can apply the ABCDEs to the mucous membrane, so, you know, um, women, genital areas, or, you know, oral cavity, obvious, jet black, three shades, asymmetry, border irregularity, not as common, but I just want you to know we can apply that, that ABCDE and ugly duckling uh, can, can really keep us in good stead. Uh, this is that acral lentiginous melanoma. Th that finger on the left, you know, could be Bob Marley's toe. Jet black. Uh, I don't know if you can appreciate if it projects well, but the base of that streak, so the, the end closer um, to the knuckle, is wider than it is at the end. That tells me or tells you that that, that, mole, that mole that's in the part of the um, skin that makes the nail plate, the hard part, has grown. You know, uh, a month ago it was, as, it, was, it was only as wide as the, the end of the nail plate because that's what the color is getting deposited in the nail plate. But boy, in the last week, which is the most recent growth at the base of our nail, it's wider. So there's activity there and, and, that's, and that activity is asymmetry. And I've got another, uh, another example of that, a side-by-side -side of normal dark streak versus versus abnormal. That's an acral lentiginous melanoma on the foot. I want you to be aware. Palms, soles, um, fingernails for African Americans. That's, your, uh, that's the highest risk of melanoma there. Um, so on the left, this is a normal nail streak. You see the base is the same width as, as the end of it. Um, it's dark. It makes, boy, it sure makes you look. It's African American skin, so um, look at the other, you know, I would look at the other nails or you would look at your other nails and oh, look, I've got, I've got four or five. Again, that's kind of like a patient that comes in with, you know, 50 quote-unquote ugly moles. You feel better about that. If this is the only nail streak, 
Now I'm going to take a close look. I'm going to say, let's, let's keep an eye on that. Let's remember our E evolving. Is this changing? Um, and, and does it need to be biopsied? Versus the one on the right, look at that width thing that we talked about. Wider at the base, thinner at, at the end. There's activity there. A little lighter skin. Still want to look at the other nails. Um, you know, does this person make a lot of nail streaks uh, or not? Obvious melanoma, jet black, irregular. Um, oftentimes, you know, these are going to a hand surgeon to do a distal amputation to lose the, the distal end of, the, of that finger. Hopefully it hasn't spread um, elsewhere by then. So finally, again, remember your A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma. Um, can, can be very helpful, especially the E changing over the course of weeks to months and the ugly duckling sign. Some more pictures of melanoma that we can apply. So, Doc, this was a normal mole. Suddenly it's become jet black and it's got this pointy area. Uh, good Lord doesn't do pointy, jagged areas, scallop things. Th th they're smooth. Do you see that point at the t at the tip? That 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 makes me more more concerned. This is the patient that we talked about. I I certainly see a lot of um, fairly large moles. There's a lot of them. Um, some of them have little specks in the middle. They give you the impression that almost little fried eggs. But I don't see an ugly duckling. Um, I, I don't see one that's jumping out at me in the mirror. And we can all look at our own skin and, and should periodically for that mole look jumping out at us in the mirror. That's the ugly duckling. Um, so, so this patient I'd recommend, I'd like to see every, every 6 to 12 months. Um, I, 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 may, I may suggest clinical mole mapping. So that's, that's professionals who take good quality pictures um, of their back, some close-ups, so that, so that they can really know is there any change. If they have that many, it can be really hard, you know to decide what needs to be biopsied or not. Melanomas on the head and neck, there's a type uh, that is almost strictly sun related. It may start as a little sunspot on the cheek or on the side of the face. A little evenly brown, kind of light colored sunspot might be there for years. Suddenly you start getting asymmetry and new colors, especially darker colors. This is on the ear. It could very well be um, right above the eye, on the, on the cheek, on the temple, um, these can be really challenging because they may hang out for a long time and then suddenly they sort of wake up, so to speak, and they get deeper. Uh, you can imagine how big of a surgery it is to, to remove all of that, that melanoma and bring it back together and, and still have a place to put your glasses. So this is on the cheek, like we talked about. There's a char charcoal black. You know, very irregular borders. That, that may have been a perfectly you know, normal, what we call solar lentigo or sunspot on the scalp um, that with continued UV exposure, sunlight, uh, turned into a type of melanoma. And you could pick that up from those, those irregularities, that darker spot in the middle, probably is your thickest area. Um, so so those, those deserve uh, a, a close eye changing you know, oh, I've had a sunspot, I'm not worried about it, it was there for five years, but, but it, then it decides to change one month. I think it's worth being seen by a dermatologist or, or at the very least being seen by your primary care doc to say, hey, is this something I need to pursue? This is another example, melanoma, this is jet black, charcoal black, same thing, really irregular. So we're going to move on to... Uh, a third uh, observation, and that's that basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer are most commonly found on the head and neck. Um, so shoulders and up doesn't spread elsewhere very commonly. Squamous cell skin cancer spreads a little bit more than basal cell, but in general, they both don't have a tendency like melanoma to spread elsewhere, which makes you reassured, but then, then we talk about how common they are. Um, that makes us a little, a little uneasy. They're locally destructive if they're left alone. They're on the head and neck, so we don't have a lot of extra skin around to just be lopping off, you know, areas, you know, once every six months and having big scars and trying to pull skin back together. If it's on the back or, you know, on the belly, sure, uh, you know, maybe we have a little leeway. But real estate on the face becomes a, a little bit 
um, harder to come by. And it's more, from a cosmetic standpoint, is more important, I think, to us. Uh, I, I imagine you'd all agree. Uh, these are some examples of basal cell. That's the most common, again, type skin cancer. It classically is going to be a kind of shiny, shiny pink um, growth that uh, changes uh, very slowly. You know, Doc, this has been here a year or two. Started bleeding about six months ago, just spontaneously. It's not because I nicked it with my razor blade. It bleeds, and I hold, you know, pressure on it. And it goes away, and might not bleed again for four or five days. It's really driving me crazy. It's got that shiny pink nature. Uh, it is is characteristic. Okay. Again, most common form of skin cancer. I highlighted that 40% uh, of patients have a second skin cancer within five years. 40% of patients with basal cell have a second skin cancer within five years. And I highlight that, again, going back to General Honoré and Dr. Chastain's um, sort of motivation for this talk is that uh, life and quality of life. I've had a, lot, a, a number of patients in, in residency that ba these basal cell skin cancers are burdening them as much as my patient who's 45 and had a thin melanoma that was treated. Um, and you say why? It's because of the frequency, frequency of these basal cell skin cancers. They find themselves once a year having to go to the dermatologist and have something cut out. Then they got a wound to take care of, you know, for six to eight weeks. Then they, then they come back and you see me in six months. They may get another little biopsy. That's a pain in the tail. Um, they got another small wound. They got a wet. It, it, over the course of the first couple of years, you know, they're like, no problem. It starts really wearing on them mentally, and, and, and I get it. Uh, and, and that's why I, I want to emphasize, I don't want you to think, oh, these other type of skin cancers aren't a big deal, because they are, because they affect our quality of life, and, you know, I don't know why I'd be alive if there's no quality. <laughs> these are other examples of basal cell. They can be really subtle sometimes. They can, they can remind you of a scar, but, you, but you're, you, you're like, I, I have no reason to have a scar there. And why is that scar getting a little bigger? Um, so these are basal cell skin cancers. They can be locally destructive. If, if left alone, they're like a very slow-moving train. They're not going to stop. They have to be treated. Um, they typically don't spread. Uh, so these are some examples. Look at that shiny pink quality. And, and you see that bottom part of that papule has recently probably bled. You know, not bleeding out or anything, but it is, it's annoying. Look how young this female is. She's probably, um, you know, 40. And, and look how subtle that shiny pink bump uh, under her eye is. I've, I swear I've had this patient, and they are really upset about having to have that surgery and have it cut out. But you catch it early, the smaller the scar. Nobody likes the scar. But uh, w under the eye, in certain areas, we can, we can hide them pretty well, but... It's not as good as, as uh, God did it. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, again, that's that second most common type. They're going to present as, as more scaly patches or even uh, thicker growth. Scaling, maybe ulcerating, maybe bleeding, kind of like the basal cell. It, it may look like a basal cell. A lot of our biopsies, before it's looked at by the pathologist, we say squamous cell skin cancer versus basal cell skin cancer. Um, and we treat them similarly. similarly. Um, a couple of high-risk areas where there's a little higher chance of spreading, and oftentimes we'll treat these, boy, we'll kind of get them right in, is, is the ear and the lip, a higher propensity to spread. Transplant patients are at highest risk for this type of skin cancer um, and is the leading cause, uh, cause of death in, in kidney transplant patients over the long term is squamous cell skin cancer. They've had so many. There's a higher risk of them spreading in transplant patients. And they don't spread often, but when squamous cell skin cancer spreads, it can be really tough to treat also. Okay, so that's a, just a pink spot. This may remind you of some of the spots that your dermatologist or doc has frozen in the past. Um, this happened to represent a squamous cell type skin cancer. Um, you know, it may be frozen at the first visit, suspecting that it's a little precancerous growth doesn't go away. When those spots that your doc freezes don't go away, say, hey, doc, it didn't go away. You know, a month later, hey, doc's still there. It's back. Um, 
it, oftentimes that's the indication of the dog. Let's biopsy this and make sure that it's not a squamous cell skin cancer. Because again, not changing over the course of days to weeks, changing over the course of months. That's a squamous cell, this crusted, scaly, ulcerated nodule on the top of the hand. That's a, boy, that's a hot spot for these, especially uh, down here in Louisiana. Sportsman's Paradise means we're fishing and our palms are up, you know, in the air. Or, you know, if this is, this is the right hand, well, this gentleman's got a clear left hand. He's a golfer. Uh, tops of the hands are, are, re are real hot spots uh, for these squamous cell skin cancers. There's one on the lip that's that high-risk area. Uh, that would need to be cut out and sewn back together. One on the nose, one on the ear, kind of thicker. That moves us to what I just briefly mentioned earlier, these actinic keratoses. Actinic refers, it's just in Latin, to sun-induced. Keratosis refers to scaliness, so scaly spots that are caused by the sun. We consider them to be precancerous growths. The, pre, the, pre, the precancer or the preceding lesion to squamous cell skin cancer, maybe in 2 to 3 percent of actinic keratoses can they turn into squamous cell skin cancers. That's why we treat them. The primary treatment is freezing, and that provides a 95 percent cure if they're actinic keratoses. If they don't go away, they need to be seen again to make sure they're not a squamous cell skin cancer, to catch it early. Um, smaller scars, etc. Those we always describe as being able to feel them better than you can see them. From my standpoint, I can feel them in the office better than I can see them. They feel like a little spot of sandpaper. Sometimes they do get thick and, yeah, you can see them. The patient, he can feel the, the sandpaper feel, um, but he also oftentimes says, you know, it comes and goes. It's, it seems to be tender or flare up in the sun for, for some reason, Doc. Um, those are all cues that these are these actinic keratoses, and I think the importance uh, of them is that it's an indication of excessive sun exposure. Yes, sir? One question. When you, when you freeze the mold and remove it, yes, sir. what's the chances of it coming back? Typically with moles, true moles, and, and moles have to do with these melanocytes and potential precursors to melanoma, Moles, we don't freeze. We will freeze a imitator of moles that, we, that we'll get to. We call them seborrheic keratoses. We often free, we, do, we will freeze those, but only, uh, only after the confidence, you know, just from looking at enough of these, that it's not a mole, it's not made of these melanocytes, it's, those other, it's another type skin cell. We can freeze that. Typically, we'll freeze those and they'll fall off over the course of you know, seven to 14 days. Um, and, and, and you don't have to treat them because they don't turn into skin cancer. The issue with those seborrheic keratoses is that they imitate uh, some of these imposters that we talked about. But yes, sir? Fooling around with moles increase the, 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 the Oh, the, that's a great question. No, sir, like freezing uh, a spot because you... Good question. No, that does not increase, uh, that doesn't make them worse or increase the chance that they're going to spread. Yeah, like wake it up type thing. No, that's a, and intuitively you would think that that, that affects it, but, but no. Alice? Do you think like liver splash makes more susceptible to skin cancer? Liver spots? Liver spots, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they don't. Although, although some people consider solar lentigos or sun-induced brown spots, they use the term liver spots, and they're an indicator, they're an indicator of, of sun. I mean, we all get sun. Um, the more sun, you know, if you're kind of predisposed to it, the more of those quote-unquote liver spots uh, you can get. But no, those are not precancerous lesions, although they can sometimes mimic these melanomas. Yeah. But we can apply our ABCDEs to those to help us. If you don't freeze moles, what do you do with them? With moles, we either, we either leave them alone or, and we're just aware of them. If the patient says, you know, I, my, uh, you know my, my waistline, my, my belt's always nicking it, it's bothering me, um, and, and we're confident, pretty confident from a clinical, just from our eye that it's not concerning, We'll shave, them, we'll shave them flat 
or we'll, or we'll actually do a real small little football shaped incision, put in a couple stitches. That allows us to look at it under the microscope and assure ourselves that yeah, that's, that's no problem. True moles. Um, moles shouldn't spontaneously bleed. Moles, sure, you know, you bump into the, your workbench or something uh, because it's sticking out. You can tear it and it can bleed. Shouldn't spontaneously bleed, though. Does an area that itches a lot, is it indicated of anything? On a mole? No, no, just on your skin. Uh, if there's nothing there, um, I, I wouldn't be suspicious of a skin cancer. Um, but, but typically, itch, itch can be caused by a lot of things. Um, you know, it could be eczema or yeah it's not I, I don't think it's that's a bad thing but it's it's sure annoying and it, it you know it deserves to be sort of followed mm -hmm. when you get those like uh, broken like blood vessels I guess from if you scratch like yeah does it, if it doesn't go away should you be concerned or um if that's all it is no but it, you know a broken blood vessel you know would lead to something that looks like a bruise and a bruise should uh, should go away in the in the time that we kind of intuitively know a bruise should clear, so it should go away. If it doesn't, you may you may have thought it was a broken blood vessel, but it's not. So use your sort of common sense, so to speak, and say bruise would have gone away. I might be mistaken. Maybe this dark spot needs to be seen. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about those actinic keratoses um, because this is a men's conference. I got to boy, the temple area in men, these actinic keratoses, uh, I mean, it's, they're just like epidemic. Um, we start wearing baseball caps when we're kids. We're not wearing broad-brimmed caps. We're using baseball caps. We, we think that that protects us. It protects our forehead. You know, I don't, I don't freeze a lot, of, a lot of actinic keratoses here until people are, you know, old enough to... You know, they're not wearing their baseball cap for 10 years or so, and they start popping up. But, boy, this, this side here, little tender sandpaper spots that kind of come and go, probably are actinic keratoses. They can be treated with freezing. If you have a lot of them, you know, you got 25, you, you don't want me to freeze 25 spots because those little, those little freezing uh, episodes kind of hurt. There's, there's some creams that you can use. That, they're not a walk in the park either, but there's good treatments for them. This is some pictures of those actinic keratoses. Remember, they may remind you of the squamous cell skin cancer, and that's, that's not surprising um, because it's a precancerous skin lesion. Um, shouldn't, these actinic keratoses, though, they shouldn't ulcerate and bleed and, and, and get big, so you can kind of keep an eye on these and we can treat them. Um, again, they're a sign of significant sun exposure. These are some pictures. Sandpaper feel, scalp. This is a lot of them. I mean, nobody wants to tilt their head forward and have me freeze, you know, 50 spots. This is a good candidate for one of those creams. Effudex or is the brand name, 5-fluorouracil or Aldera. And those are sort of like a, a chemical, uh, a cream chemotherapy that over the course of th a three-week treatment um, treats these. It only it kind of selectively attacks the cells that have been damaged, their DNA has been damaged by UV radiation. It, can, it cannot. No, sir. Yeah. Ten minutes. Okay, great. So these are just thicker uh, lesions. You know, if, if one of these, if, if the one on the right side of this gentleman's dorsal hand, um, he says, well, that one's really gotten bigger and, and it's tender. And it's tender. These other ones have been here for a while. They're thick. Those are actinic keratoses, but boy, it's suddenly it's tender and it's gotten a little bigger. I kind of want to biopsy the one on the right to make sure it's not a squamous cell skin cancer. Might freeze. The, might freeze the other ones. We, you talked um, in the New Orleans Hornets hat uh, about the seborrheic keratoses. They can imitate moles. They can even imitate squamous cell skin cancers. Oh, uh, seborrheic keratosis. Okay. Why would, the, why, would the, why would the doctor tell me that it'll never be cancer? They don't turn into uh, cancer. We just know that. We know they're very common. They don't, they don't uh, turn into skin cancer. 
Um, if, they're, if they're itchy or bothersome, they can be frozen. Um, you can freeze them off. We don't know what causes them, but we know there's a genetic component because invariably mom or dad, you know, the patient says, oh, yeah, mama had, had those. They're very common on the trunk. Uh, they, the, the characteristic, and I'll show you a few pictures, but if you can take home uh, a little tidbit of what do they look like, these little terms, if you have some, you can start looking at them and think about these terms and go, oh, yeah, okay, I see what he's talking about. They are waxy. They seem to be a little, they feel a little waxy, like they're stuck on, like they're sitting on top of the skin, on top of that purple layer I showed you earlier, not really deep set in like a skin cancer. Uh, you get the feeling you could peel them off like a sticker, but you, but you kind of can't because we try and, and, and we can't. Um, so they're stuck on, waxy, pasted bumps or little patches uh, often they're almost a little bit warty and they're annoying I, I hear you and and a lot of people don't like their appearance they can be frozen um, unfortunately insurance companies about 10-15 years ago said well you know they're not going to turn into skin cancer we're not paying for this is cosmetic so if they're symptomatic insurances cover treatment if they're got a hundred of them and and they're not itchy painful bleeding you know your bra straps not grabbing at them and stuff like that I was told that it can be taken off should it, will it come back typically not no sir they can be frozen I think that is the easiest first sort of move they can be kind of scraped off with a curette that's sort of like a sharp uh, spoon like you freeze them off? sir with nitrogen, yes sir liquid nitrogen yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely so you see this chest of this gentleman? You get the feeling they look waxy, especially that upper right. They look waxy. You just want to reach into the screen and peel them off. Um, these are those seborrheic keratoses, and they have that sort of distribution where they're scattered across the upper chest and upper back, and the number of them kind of taper off as you get lower. Um, and, and they can be they can be annoying. Some on the side uh, side of the face, uh, a certain type on the face. Uh, Morgan Freeman has is dermatosis, papulosis, nigra cans. But anyway, that's what that is. Um, we're going we're gonna to move through these uh, real quick. Um, I want you to be aware that just one blistering sunburn in childhood can double your lifetime risk of skin cancer. Uh, those sun-distributed freckles in these kids, you know this kid played a soccer tournament you know, last season and didn't put a lick of sunscreen on and you know, had his pink cheeks, and uh, this is summertime. Those will fade kind of in the winter time and become a little more prominent in the summer. Number five, it's never too late. Remember the bucket analogy. It's never too late to start protecting your skin. Uh, the sun we get when we're young is certainly important, but it's important now. I have patients who, you know, spent 10 years. They were on that cycle, that vicious every six months. They're getting something cut out. They got serious about their sun protection, whether it be, you know, being smart about what time of day to avoid, or wearing good sun protection, uh, and they vastly cut down on the number of times that they're going under the knife, so to speak. So I, I think we've made the point that most skins are, can, skin cancers are preventable, and if not preventable, early detection can make all the difference in the world. The ABCDEs uh, help us with early detection um, of melanoma. The more common non-melanoma skin cancers, I just want you to look for the, le the new lesion that's not going away in the time that we typically think that you know a little bite or something should go away that's bleeding um, and not going away and, and in these basal cell skin cancers the common ones they change over the course of many months and and they can be addressed at that time so the non-healing wound and then the ABCDEs sun protection uh, avoid peak sunlight hours um, you can avoid 80 percent of the damaging UV radiation from the sun by avoiding the really 11 to 3 um, you know if, if you're if you're working in the yard before 9 or after 5 you're avoiding 90 percent of the damaging sun rays um, we have a little sort of way to remember if your shadow shorter than you the, the sun is high in the sky and, uh, and and that means that the sun rays are most damaging when the shadows longer than you that's you're probably at a more safe time the SPF number I want to quickly hit on, that only speaks to one of the two types of UV radiation from the sun that reaches the earth, UVB. That's, the, that's what causes sunburn. But sunburn doesn't 
necessarily or totally equate to skin cancer risk. Doesn't speak to UVA protection. So when you, we're protecting from UVA and UVB now, and, and we use the term broad spectrum. Broad spectrum sun protection means we're not only getting our SPF, but we're getting some UVA protection too. In and in October of this year, you'll notice on the shelves, the FDA just finally um, approved this packaging, is that there'll be not only the SPF label, 15, 30, 45, 50, but there'll be a star, a four star rating. And the star rating has to do with UVA protection, and the SPF, again, is the UVB. They both matter, so you want to look for lots of stars, and you want to have at least a number of 30. Diminishing returns above 30. You really don't get much protection above, above 30. Chemical sunscreens, they just they take the damaging radiation from the sun, turn it into a less damaging infrared uh, radiation that, that doesn't, doesn't cause problems. The physical blockers um, have a lower risk of developing skin allergy to them. Some people who don't like kind of chemicals and stuff like that feel more comfortable with physical sunscreens and they're good. Back in the day, they were really opaque. The formulations were thick and it looked like white paint. Now the formulations, just our technology has gotten better to formulate nice creams. They're not as white and look ugly and they give good protection. They sit on top of the skin and they just reflect. Yes, sir? So if they work good, would that screen while you're cutting grass or things like that? A absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay. Where would you buy that sunscreen? Um, physical sunscreens? Yeah. Uh, just look for uh, one of those two um, uh, ingredients in the ingredient list. Titanium or zinc? Titanium or zinc? Those are the two. Either one? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, yeah. Some people think that titanium is a little more elegant, but they're based, yes, either or. My niece wears it over. She's from California. She's redheaded. And, and when she came for a visit, she had it on her skin, and you couldn't see it. It had like a, maybe a slight sheen to it. But yeah. Find one if you just hate the one you picked up. You know, give it to a friend and try a different one. Find one. There's a trillion of them out there. Find one that's comfortable, that is broad spectrum, and use it. I use my everyday. I use a SPF 15 moisturizer for my everyday. And if I'm going to the beach or going to cut the grass, I put on a 30. I use the Olay Complete. Oh, there's a, that's what I use this morning. I just when I get out of the shower, that's a moisturizer for my face. Um, and it's got SPF 15 in it, and remember the bucket, even walking to the car, we're filling up our bucket. When I go outside to cut the grass, I happen to use this. I have no financial interests in Neutrogena. It, it's good. It's good. It, it's well stabilized and everything. This is a fancier one, La Roche Passe. La Roche Passe, uh, it, it's equivalent to a lot of the other good ones, and you pay a little more for it. Um, and that's what it looks like, anyway. Does it matter how thick you put it on? Or just well, you want to put on enough. That's a great. That's a great question. And, and typically, whether I whether I train you or not, or I'm aware of it or not, I probably don't, and you probably wouldn't put on as much as you're supposed to to get those full SPF numbers. And that briefly hits on the the idea that by wearing by wearing sunscreen, you are not blocking all vitamin D production that you're going to get from sunlight on your skin because in in the real world which is where we all live things aren't like in a lab in a science lab you're not blocking every bit of the UV radiation you're going to get you know skin con conversion of vitamin D Com combine that with perhaps if you're at risk you know elderly women or, or, or that sort of thing. You may want to take a little uh, extra vitamin D, you know, even as much as a thousand units of vitamin D can be helpful. So the idea that some people are, media are saying, wait 15 minutes, go out in the sun for 15 minutes, and then put your sunscreen on. What kind of, that's just not the real world. Who goes out, cuts their lawnmower off after 15 minutes to go put their sunscreen on? I mean, that's, I don't know. I would. Before, exactly. He reads. Now, if, uh, what about buying garments that have something? Great question. I'm going to hit on that. There's a lot of good companies. Uh, you, you can search them on the internet. They make a tight weave. That's, it's thin, but it's a tight weave, and they vent them. So they're worth, they're absolutely worth it. Sun protection is a multi-pronged thing. It's being aware of what time of day and how much sun. 
is out there. It's wearing your sunscreen. It's seeking shade. And, and it's wearing appropriate clothing. I mean, some of my dad's buddies, they fish at Grand Isle, uh, I swear, every day of the year. And, um, and a number of them are dermatologists. And they, they, have, they have all the clothing, that clothing. And they're comfortable fishing all day out uh, you know, in Grand Isle with, uh, with a long sleeve, thin, but tight weave shirt. Okay, so there's no free lunch. One of my colleagues says there's no free lunch. F you know, five years of pretty bronze skin uh, may, may mean 50 years of leathery, wrinkled skin. The main thing that shows us our age is UV light. This is Robert Redford. I'm wrapping up. Number seven, we talked about avoiding the midday sun, and that's because the lower the sun is, the further it has to travel through that ozone layer, the ozone layer. Um, uh, absorbs a certain certain amount of that UV radiation. You can see the size of those little things midday versus later. Now what about winter time? Isn't the sun closer to the earth in the winter? During the winter it's a little further so it, technically uh, but, but technically technically for us where we are here in Louisiana there's going to be variation but not a ton. Uh, you'll notice, I mean I, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know you can sunburn easier in the summer than the winter, but you can certainly sunburn down here in in the winter. You know, you go you, you go skiing. Uh, the shadow rule we talked about it's cumulative. Don't forget, you know, altitude every thousand feet, maybe five percent more UV uh, radiation. Don't forget about reflected sun. We talked about clothing, reflected sun. Worst on snow. Second worst is on sand. Third worst is on choppy water, because that's really going to get reflected. If it's just glass lake. A lot of that UV radiation is is going to go ahead and penetrating the water. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.